Yeah, people are streaming in. Selamat pagi, selamat petang, dan selamat datang. Good morning, good evening to our panelists and viewers from the other side of the world, and welcome to this, the fifth edition of Gallery Weekend Kuala Lumpur, celebrating culture from KL and now virtually. Gallery Weekend Kuala Lumpur is all about collaboration. As a non-profit program, the Marquis supports arts and culture by fostering appreciation, engagement, and developing the economy through a great variety of free exhibitions and programs. This year, we build those bridges virtually, extending our reach to you. Thank you all for joining us. 
This luminary program has been the anchor feature where we create the opportunity to meet with, listen to, and discuss with experts their views and topics and developments in the art world. GWKL is unique, is a unique blazon marquee that celebrates culture, and I'm delighted to be a part of it. First off, some housekeeping notes. Today's talk is reconnecting museums, creating, and events. Please mute your mics to avoid any untoward interruptions. Today's session will consist of 10 minutes from each speaker, a moderated panel discussion of around 20 minutes, and 30 to 45 minutes of audience Q&A. You may use the chat box to direct your questions, and we will ask them during the Q&A session. So let's get started. My name is Iqbal Abdurrahim, and I've been a part of the Malaysian arts and crafts scene for over 30 years. Our first panelist today is Wanda Nanibush, who is online this morning from Toronto, Canada. Wanda is curator of Indigenous art at the Art Gallery of Ontario. She holds a master's in visuals arts from the University of Toronto, where she has taught graduate courses. A dynamic curator, Wanda has organized a slew of shows for First Nation artists in Canada and beyond. She's a published author and also an image and word warrior for the Anishinaabe First Nation. The New York Times recognizes Wanda as one of the most powerful voices for indigenous culture in the North American art world. Good evening, Wanda. Thank you for being with us today. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, our second panelist joining us from New York City is Lisa Ahmadi, a curator of international repute whose energy has taken artworks from Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan to the all important biennales of Istanbul and Venice in one fell swoop, bringing Central Asia to the fore. Lisa is the director of Asia Contemporary Art Week, which organizes large scale exhibitions, artistic collaborations and forums centering on contemporary art practices from all across Asia. She has also been a member of the curatorial team at Documenta 13. Good evening, Lisa. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Great to be here. Hi. Our final panelist is our very own Malaysian artist, Elias Yamani Ismail. Elias is a proponent of bricolage, which is the making of art through found objects. He is a founder of Satu Creative Collective, which creates and supports platforms for visual arts programs in Malaysia. He is currently putting together his 20th art show with Satu Collective at City Gallery in Kuala Lumpur. The show is called Transition Transformative, a visual experience. Good morning, Elias. Thank you. Morning. Morning. Hello, everyone. So right. why don't we begin with you, Elias? Yeah. All right. So um, uh, shall I share my screen right now? Okay. Um, Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending this session. Okay, I'll uh, be sharing about my art practice. Um, uh, since 2015, I was introduced to practice-based research during my graduate studies. Over here, an uh, overview of my presentation today. Uh, first, I will uh, explain the concept of bricolage and uh, the idea of uh, density. And uh, I will discuss six samples of my works. Uh, three curatorial works, uh, which is all done independently, and lastly, surviving the pandemic, where I share my experience. Okay. The concept of bricolage was introduced by Claude Lévi-Strauss, a French philosopher and anthropologist. Strauss wrote and documents while documenting, uh, while conducting anthropological work in locations such as Brazil, India, and the Caribbean. In his writing, he incorporates philosophical aspects such as, uh, such, uh, such as um, reflection of ideas such as uh, sociology, music, history, and literature. Basically, bricolage means to tinker, or its direct translation is DIY project. A bricoler is a person who works primarily with their hands in diverse range of materials. Over here is a picture of Claude Levi Strauss when he was in Brazil. Artifacts from the Bororo community. Uh, samples of bricolage works. Okay, this is how I did my research. Um, art practice as research explores and explains the capacity of visual arts research to create knowledge. 
helps us to understand in profound way the world we live in and how we learn to make sense of it. Okay, over here is how I contextualize my research. In this project, several works of mixed media will be produced based on bricolage approach, approach by utilizing material found on site. This work refers to extraction of ideas of density from urban built environment. In the making of these works, similar topics discussed by writers and referencing works done by other contemporary artists are undertaken to further improve the subject. As part of my research, I did two trips to Hong Kong for my field work. Um, I wanted to explain, uh, I wanted to experience how it's like to be in one of the dense places on earth. This is a sample of a bricolage method in construction. Here are samples of ideas of bricolage applied in uh, the daily life. Okay, over here, uh, to this, over to this section of uh, present my presentation, I will discuss uh, six select selected works from uh, 2018, uh, 2000, sorry, 2016 to 2018. To 2018. Um, all works presented here are to convey the idea of density from built environment. Uh, I do not uh, title this work conveniently and post different process, finishing, problem solving strategies. So I just titled it as projects referring to different projects that I'm involved in. For this uh, particular work is my first attempt in uh, visualizing the idea of density. Over here, I use these uh, metal scrubs and um, this uh, PVC pipe connector. So it's actually based on the idea of um, horror vacuum, meaning uh, fear of emptiness or filling up space. So you see over here, this uh, abandoned building or structures are being covered up by this nature. So as if you want to, uh, the audience wants to see my work, it has to have an imagination to see uh, what lies beneath the exposed structure. So next, uh, in this work, um, I fully utilize uh, waste material and discarded material, and uh, I apply multiple techniques in uh, applying this work. This work is actually uh, inspired from the excavation on the construction site. Um, over here is uh, the works are based on the idea of vents as breathing apparatus bring air into spaces. This idea is also derived from the concept of retrofitting. Okay, here are the materials that I use for the work. Uh, this is a material that I found in my friend's place uh, where he does uh, furniture and also cabinets. Okay, over here is my first curatorial project based on the idea of bricolage. I was offered, uh, I was offered uh, 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 assistance from the Rotary Institute of Malaysia to hold the exhibition one in, uh, one in KL and also brought it into Pulau Pinang uh, in, in Penang, USM. So if you want to understand uh, further information regarding the, the world of bricolage, you can just search this, uh, the title in my curatorial text, uh, meaning uh, title, Extending Ideas, Bricolage, Perspective, and Phenomenon. Um, Okay, here is the view of the exhibition in uh, MGTF Museum uh, in Fauzia, uh, Art Gallery and Museum in uh, USM. Okay, over here uh, is my next uh, curatorial work where I invited five artists to talk about their experience in the urban uh, environment. Okay, uh, we had a uh, sharing discussion uh, held at UPSI, Sultan Idris Education University, and also at Architecture Department at University of Petra, Malaysia. And this is the third curatorial project that I did uh, together with my good friend from Lisbon. Uh, he actually came uh, in 2018, and this is the exhibition uh, the, 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 in the next, uh, the next year. Uh, actually, we, both of us are uh, born and raised in, uh, in the city. So we are sharing our experience living uh, as someone who are living in the city. This exhibition was held at uh, Asian Museum uh, at University uh, of Malaya. All right, this is uh, one of the works uh, exhibited in the exhibition. This is the work uh, where I use uh, motorcycle cover sets um, uh, as part of my work. Uh, over here in Malaysia, as you know, motorcycles are popular use uh, as a mode of transport because of its um, low maintenance and also maneuverability in the city, uh, delivering 
uh, fast uh, delivery to the customers. You know? So it's also a reflection of uh, the fast pace of living life in the city. Yeah. Okay, over here, it's actually um, from my observation on these uh, concrete planters were, where we're placed by the city council or the municipal uh, to beautify the city. But somehow they uh, tend to neglect the, to understand the, 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 the roots of the plant uh, when put, put, up, put into this uh, planters, it will, uh, the, the growth will grow and somehow the, it will broke off from the concrete structure. So it's also another uh, commentary on the, uh, without understanding of the development of the city. So it will become a disaster, right? So this is another ex uh, works that exhibited in the show. This one actually inspired from this building construction and also uh, scaffolding structures that are found in this construction site. Okay, over here is the exhibition uh, view. And also we had a uh, dialogue uh, with moderated by the director of Asian Museum. And I was pleased with the result of this experience. exhibition. Uh, somehow it's like a, a full circle uh, where I, my works are exhibited together with all this collection of artifacts uh, in the uh, collection of Asian Museum. Okay, lastly, I'm, I'm also talking about how, how, how do I survive uh, around during the pandemic. The, I mean, right now we are currently surviving. Uh, the pandemic is still going on. So I feel this is some of uh, the ways that I cope through the pandemic. So I think we have to make the best time right now. Uh, stop procrastination, meaning uh, uh, you have to make time as maybe do reading, uh, maybe do some drawings, uh, make models, you know, or maybe do something, you know, that don't waste time. Okay, appreciate the time we have right now. And next, looks for inspiration, uh, such as uh, watching movies, uh, listen to dialogues, even talk to your friend, uh, anything that, is, that can help, help you to inspire you, uh, as simple as, uh, let's say, like gardening or watering a plant. Uh, next is to keep healthy, mind and body, uh, eat and sleep well, uh, be more spiritual, be near to the nature if you can, and have more human interaction. Uh, before I conclude my presentation, uh, recently I went to the city, so I found this, uh, this interesting poster where I found uh, this uh, exchanging messages uh, put on to this poster. Uh, on top of this poster, you can find this word called Pukustaka and uh, Dinding, meaning in, in, uh, in translation in English is all diary. So the dwe uh, city dwellers is like uh, exchanging ideas, their feeling, their expression at, into this poster. It's some sort of like, uh, their own wall of uh, expression. So I find this. This poster is very interesting. And the next picture is this machine uh, where you want to enter pr the premise, you have to check your temperature, right? So I find this drawing very interesting. It might look very naive, but I think uh, it's very brilliant to me. So, okay, so uh, that's it for me. Uh, if you have any question regarding my artworks or my research, uh, I'm pleased to answer your question. Terima uh, kasih, thank you, obrigado. Thank you so much. Okay, that's it for me. You've raised some um, very interesting um, questions, especially making sense of the world, uh, which is vital during the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, we'll get back to that when we have okay. the moderator discussion. Um, mm -hmm. So now perhaps we could move on to Lisa and your presentation, please. Hi. Uh, that was so impressive, Ilyas. I can't believe you 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 really <laughs> took on the advice of staying concise and precise. I'm super impressed. Artists okay. really okay. All right. have a Thank you. That. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I can follow my own advice. Um, okay, so um, I'm supposed to be uh, um, be able to share this myself. Okay, it looks like I can. Can everyone see the screen well? Okay. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, well, I, I would, um, first of all, I'm so delighted to participate in the gallery um, weekend Kuala Lumpur. I'm uh, honored to be back. I actually uh, attended the inaugural one um, back, I believe it was in 2016 um, in person. Um, it was my first time in Kuala Lumpur and it was absolutely delightful. And um, I just felt uh, at home like I do usually in any part of Asia. So um, I'm really uh, delighted to be back in this format. Um, I just wanna uh, give you a little bit of a, a background of like what, what am I doing right now? And um, because it's uh, kind of in the context of like the past and the present, um, the introduction was very generous, um, Iqbal, but I'm just gonna um, kind of give you a sense of like what, um, what I'm doing. Um, so I direct the Asia Contemporary Art um, uh, Forum, which is uh, formally known as Asia Contemporary Art Week, um, which is a curatorial and educational platform that um, has been um, since 2001 connecting leading New York and Asia-based um, uh, galleries and museums, as well as uh, all uh, sizes of arts organizations um, in very large scale citywide public uh, programs um, that include exhibitions, uh, screenings, talks, performances. And um, it focuses on a broad spectrum of artworks from across all regions of Asia. Um, and I, um, I, I started initially with um, with Central Asia as, uh, as uh, the introduction um, alluded to. And um, I, I, my presentation, I will uh, go back to, I, I can't, okay, there. Um, so uh, I wanted to show you this, uh, start with this image because actually it was the first time I attempted to actually make an artwork. It wasn't that I wanted to make an artwork, but it was in order to, um, uh, fulfill the curatorial vision that I had for the exhibition, I kind of had to make this installation. And um, basically it's entitled The Taste of Others. And if when you see in the center, there's a table and all around it, there's a massive quilted, um, a quilt and this beautiful decorated sort of setting of a living room in Afghanistan. And um, you can see the painting um, from an unknown period by an unknown artist in Afghanistan. And you can see how this has uh, been, of course, tradition uh, all over in um, other parts of Central Asia and um, Iran particularly as well. Um, but what's interesting for me is that um, when I started looking at Asia as a continent, um, I, uh, or Central Asia where I come from, Afghanistan, I really needed to um, immediately sort of, as soon as I started exploring, um, realize that it was very important to connect it to the rest of Asia and how the various parts of it uh, relate to each other historically uh, in terms of aesthetic, um, uh, aesthetic representations and cultural connectivity um, of course, uh, political, linguistic, uh, spiritual, all of that is a part of that. Um, and I can show you what, um, okay, uh, the next, this next slide, you can see that, um, sorry. All right, uh, I'm having a hard time uh, uh, maneuvering this. So maybe I, I, I get to do this myself and not have you, um, Stephanie. Okay. So um, this is uh, in like what it's, it's moving by itself. Like I'm not moving it. <laughs> I, I, I needed to, it to stay where it was. Did you press your space bar? Yeah. Okay. So um, he, the, I, I wanted to stay in this slide. I don't know why it moves. Um, as you can see, the, the installation that I made uh, in 2005, which I grew up with as a child, uh, is, it's an actual practice also in Japan. And these are the kinds of sort of um, uh, larger cultural interconnectivities that I'm interested in when I'm doing my curatorial work. 
um, that is much more not necessarily about a geographical representation or an uh, identity um, representation, but a much, much more um, sort of sharing of um, relationships uh, between the experience of um, the Asian con continental mind. Uh, 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 and in that sense, uh, the work, this next work that you're seeing is by an artist um, from the 1970s in Uzbekistan. And these are drawings that he had to make in secret in his notebook because he was not, uh, he was part of the Soviet Union um, uh, artist union and he was not allowed to, uh, these are, uh, uh, he, he, would, he was at that time, the only thing that he could do was mostly propaganda, socialist realist uh, art um, that was acceptable. And um, so these were all mostly secret works that he made in the 1970s, completely isolated from the, uh, the world of um, uh, the, the rest of the world, the Western world, uh, as part of the bipolar Soviet and, uh, Union and the United States Cold War, which was part of the Cold War era uh, throughout the world and how it affected and divided um, uh, the whole world in these two poles. And yet um, you look at this work, um, by uh, Vyacheslav Akhonov um, from the 1970s, uh, imagining these installations, imagining these, um, you know, large scale uh, um, uh, installations that he, he wanted to create. And then we have in the next slide, we have Namjum Pike, um, uh, whose works are uh, somewhere circa around the 80s, um, almost, uh, almost, it's like, it's uncanny to see um, that um, Vyacheslava had no connection, no access to this kind of uh, uh, work. He did not know of Namja Pike's uh, existence at the time. Um, all the channels uh, were uh, of uh, connectivity between the Soviet Union and, and this part of the world was uh, completely cut off and yet, um, there is something called the collective conscious that uh, artists are all tapping into. And that is something that I'm really interested in exploring. And so um, for me, again, um, most of my curatorial work is how to uh, point to some of the things that are left out, significant meanings that we end up not discussing and not relating to, um, such as this work by um, uh, Palestinian American artist uh, uh, Emily Jassir um, translate, uh, uh, translate Allah for an exhibition that I did at the Queens Museum in 2009. Um, first of all, uh, sort of including Middle East into this idea of Asia and, um, and, and uh, entering them into this conversation of Asia was something that created a lot of reactions and that was um, almost unheard of as, as early as 2000, in the early 2000s, 2005. It's uh, interesting to open today Art Asia Pacific and see um, the whole of Middle Eastern region uh, represented. So it took a lot of time for the translation for uh, many of us in the field to make that shift where Asia be began to be represented in its entirety and not just be looked at uh, from the point of view of China, Japan, and Korea, which is what normally in uh, North America, at least in the United States, that is what, um, how, uh, how Asia is viewed, right? Um, so um, I just kind of, I won't have time to go through everything, but just want to show you, oh my God, this is like moving by itself really fast. Um, I, I wanted to just show you some samples of my uh, various uh, curatorial works. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to view this for my, I'm not able to view it on my own very well. So some of these, some of these um, exhibitions are in the context of Asia Contemporary Art Week, the, the program that uh, I have been directing for over 15 years. Um, what happened and the way that things uh, uh, unfolded in, uh, with ACAF was that there, was, it, uh, there would be uh, an entire um, uh, group of museums and galleries that would participate 
by presenting their exhibitions at a particular time. And in the beginning, it was one week, but very quickly it became um, over a month and um, soon it became in, uh, seasons. And within 10 years, we were, um, we expanded so much that it began to be um, much larger. And I would be uh, almost like year round programming. And, um, but when in the context of that one period where we presented um, uh, over 35 or 40 mu uh, museums and galleries exhibitions, in the center of it, what, what we would try to do, what um, uh, my mission was to uh, uh, fill the gaps that the art scene or the institutional and gallery and museums um, wouldn't be able to for various different limitations, not having access to it, not having, um, uh, not having the resources um, uh, or also uh, the attention span of their constituencies, uh, the budget to be able to support the kind of uh, incredible amount of uh, work that is, is uh, an artist's activities that are taking place across Asia. It's a, it's a, a, it is almost in the ratio of the, the growth of what's been happening all over um, uh, Asia. It's, it's, it's impossible to have that kind of representation um, here in the US. And um, it, it, it was uh, an attempt uh, for me always to find a way to really include um, uh, both mainstream artists who uh, sometimes are pigeonholed in one way of being looked at in a particular way by the art scene, um, but also uh, uh, at the same time, bring in a very non uh, emerging artists who are possibly emerging maybe in the United States or in Europe and other parts of the world, but they are in fact um, not emerging and, and have been practicing for many years in their own um, regions, local regions. Um, this work, for example, by Son Dong, um, uh, who is a very well-known artist from China, um, we uh, were able to invite him to do something that he's been wanting to do and he wanted to do it in um, not necessarily a very mainstream um, uh, museum. Um, and this was at Mana Contemporary in New Jersey where he built uh, a cities uh, of an, uh, with, with thousands and thousands of crackers and um, cookies and candy and um, it was called Eating the City and um, everyone was invited to um, partake. And, and this project is something that he's done across various uh, parts of the world. And he's very interested in the reaction and participation of the audience and how, um, how they are able to consume something like, uh, the, uh, like eating a city and being a, particip a participant of what uh, living in a city really means. I was, I, I, I'm glad to talk about this because Elias's work has so much to do with the city and uh, living in the city. Um, so uh, uh, my interest in, in a sense, even in, the, uh, in, in breaking through um, some of the very well-known artists that continuously sort of the same artists are brought in to be paraded across museums and galleries um, because it's, um, it, it, it just is convenient um, trying to uh, go beyond that and give access to artists who uh, have made huge differences in their own local arenas and art historically should be part of um, that larger conversation but aren't. Uh, for example, this is a group from um, a, a an art collective called Kizzle Tractor, five artists who've been working together on and off for over 20 years in Kazakhstan and had never had ever had a retrospective of, of their own anywhere, not even in Kazakhstan. And so their own retrospective was held in, in New York, in, in New Jersey, also at Mana Contemporary. And they were um, invited mm -hmm. to do this, uh, uh, a beautiful um, performance that they did. We'll see a video of it later when, if we have time um, on the day of their opening where uh, interestingly enough, you can see them wearing masks and, um, and they're actually, uh, the, the, this was a, a piece that they did many, many years ago, like 20 years ago um, in, in many different cities of Europe. And um, it's called purification. It's a shamanistic ritual um, in a sense, sort of uh, a mythology and a, at the same time, a reenactment of uh, a, a cleansing. 
Um, they, they were determined to come and cleanse the United States of America off of uh, evil energies <laughs> with, with their giant drum and grunting. And um, it was a beautiful, really captivating, um, uh, uh, kind of a spectacular performance that had uh, an energy um, that really was, a, a, the, you know, uh, captured and, and involved everyone to experience um, something quite magnetic. Uh, and um, the scale of, of the, the work itself is, um, was quite, it was, it was an extraordinary um, work for us to be able to even bring all this work all the way from Kazakhstan to the, the States. And um, so these are sometimes center, central to uh, some of the weeks or some of the programs that we presented. They, they are sort of signature programs that allows everyone to participate and um, access something that they may have heard of, they may have known about, but they really don't have um, uh, the ability to experience firsthand. And um, over time, I began to really uh, think about um, what's the most important thing that I do as a curator? Um, because one of the most difficult things that we can do is to work with objects. Um, ultimately, the artists are constantly making objects and uh, they're producing work. And, and that, and ultimately, all works have some kind of a physical form. Um, but what I was interested in, how do I include in exhibition uh, making uh, the actual sort of behind the scenes aspect of working with an artist, the conversations, um, the, the, the painstaking process of knowing whether they're in the right direction and the wrong direction, whether uh, what they're focusing on is something that is really significant uh, and part of their long-term practice and um, these really um, sort of um, extraordinary exchanges that happen in behind the scenes of making an exhibition, sometimes they, or most of the time, are completely left off of um, uh, from uh, the, the public, but also even the art professionals. And sometimes we're not able to digest what, um, what an artist is doing because we just don't have access to their process. And, um, these days, artists are not just making work that is, you know, um, done in, in a studio uh, in a very sort of clinical manner. Um, and it's not just about beauty uh, or aesthetics, but really they are excavating incredible realities in the world. They are um, researching um, across all fields, multiple disciplines, and um, their work is no longer um, you know, just uh, we're not not able to sort of just pigeonhole them in in terms of medium or concepts, and um, so I'm constantly trying to think about how can we um, create exhibitions that involve the processes uh, the uh, of artists and field meeting was an answer that solved many problems for me, um, particularly the problem of shipping um, large scale works, the expenses of works. Um, but also uh, the, uh, the extraordinary um, um, amount of um, effort that it takes to um, create opportunities for artists to meet other artists, to really get critical feedback that sometimes they're not able to get by just being a part of an exhibition. And, um, and so uh, what was uh, extraordinary was uh, that um, field meeting became um, a space where 35 uh, to uh, 40 artists, museum directors, curators, um, as well as uh, thinkers, all kinds of creative individuals who want to, who have, uh, who are really currently involved in, uh, in all aspects of the, of the Asian art scene are invited to um, really take risk of how they're going to present their work in a way that is extraordinarily compelling, and it, it really helps them move uh, their work to another, to another, uh, to the to the next stage, the next um, level. Um, be able to really benefit from what is it that they're doing, and understand for themselves where they're going with the work, and receive support in a very communal way. So it was almost as if. Um, emulating the, the uh, experience of, of going to a studio 
and visiting an artist and really um, having a connection with them energetically. So the presence of the artist is inc incredibly important. Um, I will go ahead and tell you just a little bit about at least one of these because you're seeing so many extraordinary images and I'm sure you're wondering what in the world is all this about. Um, I think for me, what ended up happening was that if I wanted to sort of, instead of um, focusing on the object, to focus on the energy of the artist and their uh, process and their activity, it meant that uh, I needed to sort of forefront uh, particular mediums. And one medium that I fell in love with was, of course, besides performance, is um, the medium of lecture performance, which connects um, sort of the, uh, the educational and uh, all of the sort of academic background, the, uh, the uh, inquiries that are an artist launches into in their career alongside the, what, what they create formally, the images that they create. And um, this medium is more and more used by many artists. And um, it, it, I would uh, uh, highly recommend that you um, visit um, ACAW's website and you can see all of these uh, the, these presentations, they're, they're archived very, very well. And um, I won't have time to get into actually telling you much about any of them because I feel like we need to move forward. I'm being given um, the sign to, 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 uh, to around, uh, finish up. So, um, but I highly recommend that you do um, visit um, the website and look at uh, some of the works because they're, they're uh, extraordinary and they're short. They're about 20 minutes, 15 minutes each, not long. So um, you would be able to really get a taste of artists from, again, um, all parts of the world. I, um, I'm very uh, sort of sad that I forgot to include um, um, a couple of uh, amazing artists from Malaysia that I've included in field meeting, um, Nadia, uh, Nadia Bam Haj, who is actually uh, originally from Indonesia, but lives in Kuala Lumpur and Hassanal um, uh, Israif Idris as well. Um, so uh, I think that I will have more chance to address uh, some of the other things that I wanted to address with you in terms of institutions roles beyond the curator's role in uh, expanding um, ideas and practices of Asia, uh, not only here in the United States, but throughout the world and other matters uh, in our discussion. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa, illuminating as always. And I, I like the fact that you find all these connections between different cultures like Korea and Uzbekistan. They're so far apart, they're so different. And yet, you know, thanks to collective consciousness, as it were, you know, people get to sort of do the same thing, but not quite the same thing. And I'm listening to you, I think it's clear to say that you brought the Arabs and the Persians into the fold of world art. Thank you for that. So now I think we can move on to Wanda, who's been patiently waiting. Um, Wanda, off you go. Thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm really enjoying getting to know my fellow panelists and um, I'm sure everyone out there watching is beautiful and lovely and thanks for being here. I'm Wanda Nanabush, Anishinaabe Khoi from Bosley First Nation, Wolf Clan, and I am going to show you five artworks that give me five kind of thoughts about what I've been thinking about curating in the pandemic and the call for racial justice in the world. So I'm starting with um, this work, which is by Sandra Brewster. Um, and it's an untitled work, but it's part of a series of works that she calls Blur, done in relatively recently. So I work at um, the largest museum in Canada. It's about a city block. So you can imagine this is a massive wall. Um, and this is a photograph. Um, it's actually a gel wall transfer. So, that's where you print the paper and then you paste it up and then you wash away the paper and all that's left are some of the ink. So the process of making the photograph is as important as what it's about um, because 
she uh, is talking partially about um, the way in which when we move from one place to another, so in her case, from the Caribbean to Canada, um, often you have this box of photographs, you know, and you pull them out and they're all folded and they have this uh, sense of time, uh, sense of hands that have touched them. And it's um, kind of the memory that you carry with you uh, when you move. Um, and so this transferring from one, one surface to another, to the wall, um, partly speaks to that. Um, but what I wanna talk about here is less that than the framing. Um, so this is kind of a, a suite of galleries that you walk into that's called the Indigenous and Canadian Permanent Collection Galleries. And so it's one of the first things that you will come and it's quite, it's large and so it, it kind of engulfs you, it's a bit immersive. And the reason that I'm bringing it up is because in the con, because it reminds me, I think with this work, it reminds me of the necessity of maintaining um, artists at the center of what we do. So when we think about all the ways in which museums are failing um, black folks worldwide and other folks, um, it's this work kind of reminds me that when we think about how to show the work in the gallery and how to build collections that are more diverse, um, not to put people in boxes. And so this work in, in the way that it is, it's a woman moving and it creates, she had people moving in front of the, ca in front of the camera. So it creates this blur. Um, it's all people from the community, but you can't exactly tell who it is. Um, so there's a way in which she is talking about um, what uh, Glisson calls opacity, which is just really to break it down. It's the idea that we need to understand that we can't understand each other all the time. We can't know everything about each other. And the fact that we can't is part of the beauty of being human. And it's part of the beauty of meeting others. And it's part of um, what we should be protecting about each other. So instead of making everybody the same. So I'm sure lots of countries have gone through and especially indigenous people have gone through assimilation programs, right? Where we're in Canada, it's like we're expected to be Canadian. And we have gone through that here so um, and really resisted it. This is a work by Rebecca Belmore, two works actually, Tower I'm going to speak about first, but they go hand in hand. So Tower and Tarpaulin. And Tower is made from shopping carts um, that have been set up almost like a condominium tower. And then you think about um, this is clay. So this is actually unfired clay, wet clay that's applied in the gallery as soon as it's um, put up. So the clay has to be done every single time that it's shown. And um, it brings in a kind of organic uh, material into the space, which museums hate, but you know, I love and artists love <laughs> and audiences love. But you can think about either the, the clay is coming from underneath and erupting up, or it could be like a landslide. It could be flowing down and out either way. Um, and some of what she's thinking about here is that as cities um, globally move upwards, build upwards, build all these condominiums, um, more and more people don't have a place to live. So the, the homelessness issue in the globe is, is growing as, as much as like we're building and building and building. Um, and that makes absolutely no human sense. And I've been thinking about this a lot during this work a lot during COVID because in our city, and I think cities around the world, we have um, what are called tent cities that have grown up in parks. And um, you go down the street and because the street has been emptied of commerce and everyone else, um, a lot of the homeless folks are out socializing and they've kind of taken over the city in a certain kind of way that I find quite beautiful. Um, but currently as we start to open back up, uh, the police are coming in and removing these tents from the, from the parks. And uh, I keep thinking about what as museums is our responsibility? What is it as cultural workers? What is our responsibility um, to these communities? And I think it's really important that we think about that and that it become part of our practice. So tarpaulin is um, the smaller piece that you see down and this is fired clay. And you'll see the back, it looks kind of burnt. 
it almost looks like scorched earth, um, but you'll also get the sense that it's a blanket. And there's also these grommets, which make it like, um, like a, a tarp. So in Canada, you'll see a lot of people because we have cold winters. Um, if you're living outside, these are really prized possessions, your blankets, your tarps and your tents. Um, and then you, you look at the front of this and it's quite haunting because it's absent, there's nobody underneath, but it has the sense of a body that was there. And I think about the way in which, you know, um, maybe the 99% of the world, but also, and the homeless people without land um, and indigenous people have been become people without land in our own land, um, that they haunt, they haunt this rapid, rapid industrialization and the rapid growth um, that both of you spoke to. I wanted to show this photo because we did this um, event with the work, uh, which is a round dance, um, which is a specifically prairie indigenous uh, ceremony, which um, I'll tell you a bit of the story. There was a young woman who lost her mother um, and she was mourning her mother and she was couldn't ever stop grieving. And um, this uh, spirit came to her and gave her a dance, a, a round dance, in order to take it back to the community and the community is supposed to perform it together in a circle. They dance holding hands in a circle and there's songs that are sung with it. Um, and that's to turn mourning into celebration and to take the isolated grieving individual and put her back inside the community and have the community help her with her grief. And I think about we, thinking about that in terms of um, this dance became a global movement in 2012 to 2016. It's still kind of going on, but not at the same rate. And I was one of the organizers in the city of Toronto for this. And um, we would do these round dances everywhere in the streets and shut down traffic. And the idea of politics, the way in which our struggles and our resistances, um, the way in which mourning the fact that we haven't won yet is part of the politics, um, I think was very central in this. And I think it's important for me as a curator to keep, keep thinking about the way in which what we do in the street um, relates to what we're doing in the museum and bring those worlds together a bit more. So this is Robert Houle, who um, is an, another Anishinaabe artist like Rebecca Belmore. And, but he is an older generation, he's 73 today, um, but was one of the very first kind of modernist um, painters, works in oil. This is a very recent work. I have one of these on my wall in my living room and my brother has the other one, um, has one of them. Um, and so just to tell you how personally <laughs> invested I am in thinking about what this work means, I wanna talk about one in particular, and this is Shaman Dream in Color. So he created these at the end of a process in 2008 on my birthday, unfortunately, uh, the government of Canada apologized to Indigenous people for placing their children for 150 years in residential schools. So imagine waking up in a community with no children. This is what happened to the parents, um, the police and the churches and the government all together took all the children out of all indigenous communities and placed them in schools and wouldn't let them return home. And part of that process, uh, which we call cultural genocide today, some people call it just plain old genocide and um, the Canadian government likes to refer to as assimilation. <laughs> um, <laughs> these are all mean different things. Um, this process led to a huge amount of sur survivors kind of suing the government for this, for what happened. And so eventually, um, as the court case finished, um, the, um, the apology happened. And Robert started having new memories of things that happened to him in the schools um, at a later age. And he started drawing out those memories. And this comes after he's dealt with that trauma. The, the, the remembering of that trauma. And so what, was, what they were trying to kill is this very thing, that shaman dream in color. The fact that we have spiritual traditions, we have different ways of understanding the world, we have 
different ways of, of thinking about what a human being is, what the earth is, what our relationship is to animals, to the earth and to each other. Um, and they tried to kill that. And I also think about dreams in particular as a curator, I do my shows through dreams. So I don't know, they're never finished until I can kind of dream, dream it and then it, there it is. And dreaming as a form of communication uh, between the spirit world and the human, um, I think is a really important communication. And I think as we go into this post COVID situation or this current COVID situation, these need, the need for healing, the need for um, thinking about what the spirit is in balance with the mind and the body, thinking about our relationship to the earth and thinking about our relationship to other beings besides humans and thinking about our relationship to each other um, is becoming central to what makes us relevant or not. This is a work by Carl Beam, Burying the Ruler, which talks very much. You'll see this little, little, little red Thunderbird over one shoulder and then the cross over the other shoulder. So this is a cheeky piece, <laughs> um, sort of saying like, this is the choice that we were given and he is burying the ruler. So he's both burying the residential school kind of education, but he's also burying the colonial ruler. And he's also burying the mindset that comes with colonialism. So the last piece is Michael Belmore, who's another Anishinaabe artist. Um, it's called Edifice. Edifice has two meanings. One is like the facade of a great building. And the other is um, kind of a set of values or beliefs that um, something is built on. So like the edifice of capitalism. And in this piece, He's dealing with all of those, the, both of those meanings at once. So this was carved. Uh, he went to a river, pulled out huge boulders and hand carved each piece. So each piece comes from a boulder and it's very labor intensive. The stone is the same stone that is what our parliament buildings are built out of in Canada. So he is talking about the edifice of the Canadian nation state and the Canadian economy and what it does to the earth, to indigenous folks. But you'll see that the, the ground has a topography. So it feels like kind of a landscape, but at the same time, it's cut up, it's broken. And then you'll see this one line of copper going right through the rocks that kind of feels like a fire. It's warm, it has life. Um, and it's just peeking out there. And it's kind of a really hopeful vision um, that this, this way of seeing um, uh, copper, the Anishinaabe way of seeing copper is that it's the lifeblood of the Thunderbirds um, who are the ones who flow between the, the upper world, the spirit world and the human world. They are the ones who can go between. And they're also partially communicators. So we believe that copper is kind of a healing, um, which has proven to be true. <laughs> um, copper is a healing metal. And by placing it in here, he's kind of speaking um, in this amazing way about how the earth itself, it works on geological time, right? It looks, we're, we're just a blip in its lifespan. And if we just change our mind frame, um, we can start thinking that way and, and put our, the human back where it belongs in this much smaller space in this long story. Okay, I'm just gonna stop there. Wanda, there's plenty to think about there, and it's especially intriguing to see from a First Nation point of view, because most of us, we live in big cities, we live in normalized society. We don't actually ever get to meet or speak to artists from those communities. So thank you so much for that. I think we've seen a whole load of incredibly beautiful images from all our panelists, and I, I really want to thank you for that, because rarely we get the chance to, to be exposed to such amazing works. Now, I'd like to open the floor to a discussion. Um, and if I could start off with the first question, uh, this goes to the ladies. I'm sorry, Elias, you're gonna have to wait for your question. All right, all right, no problem. Ladies, um, you, you um, live in and come from very patriarchal societies. And the pandemic has sort of wreaked havoc in a lot of things that you do in terms of financing, in terms of reputations, in terms of what you're allowed to do. 
Has it gotten worse? Has it gotten any better? Are people more sensitized or sensitive to, to womanhood, to what women need and require in the professional working space? Take it away, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I think I would answer it by um, just, I don't have the uh, statistics of uh, the force uh, when it comes to uh, the art scene, but I can tell you that it is, um, uh, at least in the nonprofit arena, um, but I, I, I'm pretty sure also in, in the galleries and the universities, um, it, it, based on my own work with um, young professionals who are entering the field, um, five, uh, you know, five out of uh, six are women. <laughs> um, so, you know, I don't think that we're, we have passed the state of looking for permission or asking for permission. Um, that has actually been, um, you know, in, in reality, um, feminism, true feminism has always um, um, taken place in the doing, um, mm. just in the rhetoric of asking, um, you know, and, and that is the, um, the, the you know, true femininity to me comes from um, be creating sort of a womb, um, a space that we could receive um, what is, um, what the, and the energy of creativity, what, wherever it's coming from, whether it's from um, nature, allowing nature to uh, do its work um, better, and um, whether it is nurturing um, the work of artists who are uh, young and just beginning their work, but also nurturing um, the relationships that we have and becoming aware of our own relationships with women. I have learned how to um, uh, create checks and balances in my own competitiveness towards other women and understand that um, if I create space for um, uh, collaboration um, with, with women, but also uh, be very respectful in how I approach men and the way that I collaborate with them, um, it, it makes a huge difference. Um, so to me, I feel like uh, the pandemic hasn't really done um, much different. Uh, I, I hope that it has helped because it has allowed um, both, the, the, both men and women to have to sort of work together a lot more and share space together a lot more and negotiate things. Um, so I, I have a much more perhaps positive uh, outlook in um, the, the, the opportunity of, uh, you know, both whether for us to create, to shift um, this, that, this idea, this notion that we're still a patriarchal society. I believe that we were, no, we're not and that that maybe in, there's a still a, a sort of a veneer, a facade that holds that idea together, that concept, but um, the reality is far, far, far from um, that. And, 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 and at least in, in New York City and, um, in the, and also within the communities of international artists and um, uh, art practitioners that I'm working with, um, there is a, a, a very, very, um, active feminine energy um, present. I feel like um, that patriarchy is alive and well in the world. And um, <laughs> it just like joins to other things in new and interesting ways. I am, um, and I also exist within um, the rejuvenation of, in, of Anishinaabe, my nation's ways of doing things, which was egalitarian. So um, I have other pathways out besides um, feminism, but I am also engaged in feminist em enterprises. But I had this one conversation, I'll just to say something, where I said I would never do a woman's art show, like never. Um, we're just past that, right? And then I sat down with Rebecca Belmore, who I showed you the work, the big tower piece, and um, another artist, um, Lori Blondeau, 
two indigenous women. And we're sitting there having wine on my porch and um, they got so mad at me. <laughs> I was like, what, what am I saying? They're like, indigenous women are the lowest paid and the least shown out of all artists, period. So to not pay attention to it is just to feed that even further. And so then I went and did the research and my God, they were right. Like I looked at the stats, I looked at the amounts and indigenous men are slightly above them, but not much. <laughs> and um, I also looked at the stats of women artists and museums versus male. And it's just not, it's just not true. There isn't equality yet. So, and all the directors in Canada minus one are men. So majority of women working in museums aren't at the top. They're all the laborers, like all of us who care and do and, you know, like normal. Um, and that's, um, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, well, that's interesting. So Canada, no change. America, some change. That's odd considering your political situation. Uh, the stats are the same in the States. <laughs> that's probably true too. So how, where do you yeah. see it going? I, I would just I would just say that the answer my answer um, was not based on um, on you know this it's much more personal I'd like to uh, to uh, address uh, based on not based on what is um, the you know it, it's much more to me, it's much more practical to base my answers on um, the shifts that I'm seeing within the within the environment and my own work. So, but I think I agree 100% with Wanda in terms of the larger, um, you know, realities. There's no question about that. Um, that th those discrepancies still do exist, um, and yet at the same time, we I feel that it's really important that we point out and hold on fast to our contribution. The contributions that women are making in a variety of fields, and uh, that they're absolutely. I'm just no longer wanting to buy the story of victimhood, and you know somebody has to hand us something. Um, we we we're no longer we're not waiting. We've never waited. Take it. And, you yeah. know, take exactly. it. We'll let you take it. Don't worry. Uh, Elias will let you take it. Elias, <laughs> do you have any views on, on patriarchy? You know the stuff we keep pushing. Mm, uh, yeah, I do agree with the two panels. Yeah, it's it's an ongoing situation, uh, especially over here also. And talking about, uh, I mean, there's like differentiate between uh, women artists and uh, male artists. So I, for me personally, uh, I don't have that differentiation. I mean, yeah, especially during I when I did the extending ID ex exhibition at uh, MGTF BSM, I was the only male. So I I, re I do I do respect. I mean. With female artists, they are equal you know, to me. Yeah. Good to know. Good to yeah. know. So yeah. do an all female exhibition yeah. next time. Yeah. All yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so another interesting thing that's been happening around the world is of course Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think Canada, the United States, even to some degree, Malaysians have been supporting BLM. And I sometimes I don't think we actually understand what it's all about, but never mind. How has that impacted your institutions, do you think? Has it, has it made a difference? Has it made any changes possible? Um, you know, especially for a First Nation institution like your gallery, has Black Lives Matter made an impact? So my gallery is, um, is an encyclopedic museum. So it's massive and has everything from European art to Canadian art to whatever. I've been building and carving an indigenous part of that. So it's very different. It's not, an, it's not a First Nations gallery at all. Okay. Um, so I would say, you know, the movement to recognize First Nations um, as the, you know, the original people of the land who never really gave it up. <laughs> we didn't just go here, take it. Um, is, has been a movement uh, pretty much since the, you know, the, since the beginning of, of colonization, but within the museum sector um, really grew strong from the 60s, 1960s onward. But as far as people like me getting hired in the museum, that's mainly in the last uh, five years. So um, it's relatively new in that sense where, um, and it's all been pushed through by First Nations artists 
that are also curators. Like majority of us were art makers who became curators because no one else was curating indigenous work. Um, and I think Elias, you can relate to that, right? It's like, we have yeah. to curate our own people because yes. no one's really looking, yeah. right? Yeah. So exactly. all exactly. the first curators yeah. are often both, but it means the curating's yeah. a bit different, right? I was yeah. actually gonna ask you about that. And I'm curious mm. to see what, you, if you see something like that. <laughs> Elias? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, um, uh, basically, I have to, uh, I, don't, I, I can't wait uh, the opportunity to come. So I have to create the opportunity. That's it. You know? uh, that's it, how, how, I, how I practice my uh, art practice. Yeah. yeah. And it's actually very interesting to note that all across um, uh, the world, there's, uh, I mean, you know, this, this idea of like, um, uh, curator existing outside of being an artist doesn't always, it doesn't really exist. Like I meet so many um, artists all over Asia that um, out of necessity, yes. they not only become like yeah. you, Elias, yeah, yeah. They, they almost become mini institutions. <laughs> they are yeah. doing, um, uh, you know, curatorial work, they're making their own work, they're fundraising, they're yeah. Um, uh, you know, working with galleries, they're mm -hmm. uh, doing grassroots community work. Yeah. It's really um, extraordinary. And, and one of the other things um, I think that we were talking uh, with Iqbal, uh, the, that we have, we can see in terms of common denominators between mm -hmm. uh, regions of the world and people of the world who maybe uh, uh, fall into marginalized uh, sectors is that you know um, they they learn how to really um, um, be very resourceful, and um, there's something about the collective um, be, being able to work in collectives. Um, mm -hmm. Not only because that is their uh, sort of background in terms of, for example, in Central Asia, um, I was astonished to find uh, uh, so many uh, collectives uh, working together. Like, like this idea that an artist could individually own a work and you know, and, and had to have their name on it. It was just not really an issue for them to come together and create work and not uh, to worry about what was, you know, who's the owner of what um, later. And some of them are actually dealing with the repercussions of that, you know, from 20 years ago where they were working in collectives and suddenly one or two of them got picked up by the so-called international art scene. And, you know, now they have, they're kind of like, oh, that's my work and that's your work. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, in terms of um, the, the, uh, the beginning of their, their practices, um, so much of it has to do with um, their background. What was it, how, how did they practice and how, how uh, they felt that they can, their, this individual versus the community, um, it just, uh, there, there's uh, a, such a um, uh, such a conflict right now for the uh, communities uh, to learn how to have that approach that um, seems to be what will put you in the sort of driver driver's edge in the in the West. Something that um, it people are having artists communities are having a, 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 a not interested in or <clears throat> when they and get involved in it. It's not. Um, the most natural practice. Mm -hmm. We do have one question there. Can yep. We, uh... Let me read the question to you from an anonymous attendee, obviously someone very famous who doesn't want to know they're watching, doesn't, doesn't want to know. Okay. <laughs> do you think that art institutions, art and institutions play a role in the contemporary concerns surrounding us? I think that's like BLM and the pandemic. Moving forward, how do institutions present controversial art or sculptures? Should they be displayed despite their controversy for the purpose of education or taken down? In light of the Rhodes Must Fall movement and the removal of the Edward Colston statue in Bristol and the petition to remove Cecil Rhodes' statue in University of Oxford, what's your view on this? Well, I think it's just to say that taking down of statues of people who've done violent things in the past is different than taking down artwork. Um, I understand that you can think of a statue as an artwork, but I think <laughs> um, it's not the same in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, as an, uh, it's, a, it's such a hard thing, uh, personally, 
because I think I'm surrounded by sculptures and statues of the, the, the white men from Britain and France, <laughs> to be very specific, <laughs> uh, who colonized this country um, and who enacted the violences, some of which I talked about. Um, how to address that, I think, is um, I'm open to multiple ways. So there are people who've, you know, done really interesting things like, you know, paint them or cover them or, you know, do those kinds of things with them. There are people who are just tearing them down. There are people who are just putting up contextual information around them, you know, like this is the violence that this person committed. Um, and then there are people who are um, building their own, right? Like just don't even look at that statue at all. It doesn't enter my worldview. I'm gonna build my own thing over here, right? So there's so many different ways to approach that issue. Um, and I, I welcome them all. Like I don't, I don't have um, a program that I would tell people about. Um, I did curate a, a show with these statues in mind, a performance art exhibition. Mm -hmm. And this one artist um, did a really, really smart thing where he kind of performed on the statue in a way that just took away its power just in the mere in his mere presence and how he played on that statue so and the funny part is it's a, a statue that india didn't want because it's of king edward the whatever and it was massive mass him on a massive massive horse so it was a reminder of colonization to them so who takes it but canada <laughs> it's just like oh my goodness you know just tour him around little guy. <laughs> Edward must have been pleased to find a home, finally. I'm sure he was, and then abused by a nice man. Well, yeah, nothing like being abused <laughs> by a nice man. I think we all know about that. So yeah. there's a question from Bojana Stancic. Um, considering you all work in different institutional landscape, what is your perspective on collecting as a way of supporting and engaging with contemporary conversations? I think, Elias, this is something you should be able to answer. Mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a proponent of, you know, making art. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about collecting? About collecting, uh, I mean, uh, in, in my personal pra practice, I, I, did, uh, I did have a lot of this uh, thinking and rethinking about objects, uh, but uh, in, in, in the case of institutionalized uh, organization, I think they are, uh, I mean, they are, they are a bit conservative in, in looking at these objects. I think they are, should be more adventurous and maybe should be more attentive to this uh, new approach. And in, in, in as, uh, I had this discussion earlier uh, where we where I discussed about museum presentation, right? Uh, where our museum collection has this very archaic type of presentation. I think it, it should be a, a, a new type of presentation. Maybe you could ask a, a curator that have a fresh idea or a fresh intake or view of these new objects in, 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 the, in the museum to present it uh, in, a, in a contemporary uh, perspective. Uh, that's, that's my view on this, this, this issue. Yeah. Lisa, do you find a lot of people looking at Central Asian art and wanting to collect? Yeah, um, I would like to actually um, uh, talk more broadly in terms of Asia because I, okay. uh, I think um, just, just to be clear that I don't just work with artists from Central Asia. If you notice the the imagery was from uh, across all of Asia, and that really is um, the goal because um, there is no such um, sort of continental vision for uh, Asia, and that is the ma main problem, the way that collections have been presented in museums, as Ilya said, has been in a very fragmented uh, and um, of course it was uh, part of the um, colonization um, process. So everything is uh, sort of uh, archived and uh, presented in that archaic way of this is Middle East and Middle East has nothing mm -hmm. to do with China and China is here and India is there. And it, it is so um, remarkable that these um, colonial uh, uh, sort of mind uh, um, sh uh, control has continues to live in our, in our in, in and up to today in our minds and 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 it, it has created that fragmentation within the the 
a collective conscious of Asia itself, where mm -hmm. um, China will actually not even, even though it has a, a tiny border with Afghanistan, it, it will, there would be, you go to a, a, any normal um, Chinese individual and they most likely will not be aware that they, they're neighbors of, of Afghanistan. And, and, or that, you know, Iran or Japan may have a lot more in common with one another than, um, than you know, uh, Japan and the United States. Um, so this, this, to me, um, collections is, is a very important way for uh, curators to take responsibility for uh, in um, redefining, uh, realigning, and um, completely sort of uh, uh, starting from scratch because they um, affect uh, how we see art history, how we uh, view our own contributions to the, the, uh, the world uh, art history. And it is always told from the perspective of this East-West uh, you know, yeah, yeah. dynamic that is very disempowering. Mm -hmm. And I think that artists are doing such a phenomenal job in um, reorienting um, uh, everything from collections to exhibition making to education. Um, we really need to pay attention to what artists are doing because they are the, 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 the ones that are paving the way for um, all of us to look at what, is, uh, what, what we can do um, in the future. And they're not waiting for permission, at least uh, those in, in Asia, all over the various different mm -hmm. parts of the regions, they don't have access to that institutional support. And they, uh, they, they, some of them get to go do residencies across uh, various regions, but many of them just are creating in their own pace um, a lot of uh, sort of a newer, new archival ways of thinking about collections. And I hope that those who actually are able to put money behind it and buy work um, really, you know, um, start to take advantage of maybe listening and having artists as their consultants rather than, yeah. you know, bank, uh, bank, <laughs> old yeah. bank managers and people who are working in finance who are uh, suddenly showing up and trying to uh, say, I know what you should collect in your home. Um, it's very disenchanting. Mm -hmm. Totally. Any views, Wanda? Because I've got a question specifically for you from one of our viewers. Yeah, I think I work with collections. So I'll, let's just go to the next question because I really feel like Elias and Lisa covered like yeah, I think all they the did. parts of that I would say as well. I agree with them completely. So Nasreen Himada has a question specifically for Wanda, but happy to hear from others. I'm wondering about intimacy and intuition in your curatorial process, or how they, con how they condition what comes to be felt in the space of your exhibitions. You had mentioned once in a talk about an ethics that's grounded in the idea of treating the museum as a gathering space, like a conversation with friends and family taking place in a kitchen. That has always stuck out for me in your practice. Would love to hear more about that. Uh, thanks, Nazreen. <laughs> um, yeah, intimacy. Uh, I think I'm uh, interested in how to create intimacy within public spaces where it's not meant to be there. And intimacy because formalism, form, for, formalities actually can prevent us from engaging the work, whether it's the artwork or the public event that you're at, you know, like if we really want artwork to do its work, it has to come inside, you know, it has to affect our body, our, our spirit, our mind, our, the whole thing, you know. I believe this even about the most, you know, the, mo the artists who say that they try to strip all of that out of their work. It's still the audience, it's, it, we still wanna feel it we still can feel it. Um, yeah, so an ethic. Um, a, also, it's related to the fact that I think museums, as they've developed in the West, I can't speak for elsewhere, um, but I am seeing, I'm seeing it replicated everywhere I travel in the world, which is um, a little bit scary to me, um, is based on a kind of um, colonial thinking like it comes out of colonialism it comes out of class it's a very upper class kind of driven space 
Um, it comes out of a sense of disciplining bodies, you know, making bodies quiet, making bodies um, move, move um, carefully, all this kind of stuff, um, which means that not every single body is comfortable in a museum. And many of the communities I work with um, that I want to be comfortable in the museum don't fit that type. So I have to change the atmosphere of the museum, the way it feels, the way it functions, so that more people want to come in and engage the work. Because I think artists want to talk, they want to talk to people, you know, art is meant to kind of engage an audience. So it's not like we want to just have the four people who understand it either, you know, so yeah, so I think it's part intimacy is also part of, of changing the way museums work. Um, and then I think from an Anishinaabe perspective, our understanding of truth is, um, is that it's like you can only speak truth of what you actually know, what you've experienced, what you have engaged in life. So this idea that I can cite my truth based on others only and never having experienced it myself is, is not truth. And so everything, it has to be intimately engaged at that level. So I think that's also part of where I'm coming from. Okay. Um, going back to the current situation uh, with the pandemic and the need for uh, social distancing, Elias, you <laughs> sent me some photographs of your current exhibition, which is really beautiful. The, the way you use the space is stunning. Thank you. Perhaps has social distancing affected how the exhibition feels or what the audience gets out of the exhibition? Because you can't put things too close to each other. You know, and some, some things relate to one another closely and intimately, but they have now a distance that sort of negates that. It becomes a negative space in, in, in a way. Mm -hmm. Have you found uh, a way around that or do you just have to live with it? Uh, uh, based on my experience uh, recently, I mean, uh, this ongoing exhibition, uh, I feel that um, you cannot uh, diminish the, uh, the, the conventional type of exhibition. But uh, in this case, uh, we have to adjust to the current situation. Uh, like um, I had to limit the, the type of audience, uh, amount of audience to, to view the exhibition. Uh, so it's a, it's a very slow and gradual process. Um, but somehow I feel it still has the uh, it still have the intimacy and also it still have the uh, effects to the audience uh, looking at the artworks. Mm -hmm. And, and partic in this particular exhibition, um, I purposely choose a, a small amount of works so that um, the audience has the opportunity to immerse and really have a good look at the artworks. Yeah, so uh, this is a very rare opportunity. That's why I, I took this task to have this exhibition done uh, so that um, uh, the, the experience of looking and the artwork is, it can, could be in, inspiring to the audience who are looking at the work. Yeah, there, there, I'm sure there is a limitation, but uh, I'm, I'm, we are trying to adjust to this uh, current situation, situation right now. Yeah. So for those of us who are in Kuala Lumpur, the exhibition is running at City Gallery and it is worth a visit. Yeah. yeah thank a question you. for Lisa. Um, you have a lot of <clears throat> physical um, entities in your exhibitions and the work you do, um, how are you trying to overcome the issue of having everything go online for now? Because th there's a completely different feel to it. You, you, just, you just don't get the vibe from a work of art or whatever through the internet. What, what can we do? What can we do to overcome that, to solve that? Um, I'm actually not, I'm not, I'm not, um... I am trying to, um, I, I wrote an article about four months into um, the uh, pandemic um, and it was called um, uh, Process Over Outcome. I'm okay with no end in sight. Um, and it was my response to um, the art world's um, I, I was I was of course very impressed by um, how everyone um, really sort of rallied and uh, immediately responded by getting on Zoom. Um, and yet at the same time, um, it was incredibly overwhelming, daunting, and upsetting for many of uh, of artists and practitioners who felt like 
they couldn't even have a, a, a crisis, a moment of crisis where they could just not have uh, like this capitalist um, consumption of, of attention, um, you know, just uh, this this robbery of your your most intimate moment. Since we're talking about intimacy, let's let's go there. Mm -hmm. um, and and for me, I, I I I what I needed to do because I, I I need I had already been in this moment of after so many years of back-to-back -back, uh, production and planning and presentations uh, over and over again in this really large scale manner of uh, creating a space and name for so many people. Mm. I had already had allowed myself to give myself a little bit of a step back because I, it was really important because even in that large scale um, uh, productivity, um, my goal was very similar to Wanda's. How do I create uh, experiences transformation? Ultimately, I didn't get into uh, the art world for um, the beauty and aesthetics. Love that. That's of course I'm in love with that. It's, there's no doubt. But um, ultimately, I came because I, I fall in love with people and I fall in love with what they do and why they do it. And that is what um, moves me um, to do uh, the kind of effort it takes to um, uh, make make these programs happen. So. I, I felt it was really important to give um, this other point of view, which was being um, quietly whispered among all my colleagues, um, you know, who were upset about the xenophobia that came out, um, out of the, uh, you know, the, the divisive um, language on all sides and um, the experiences, this sudden sort of backward experiences that we were all having um, about what is what's happening here, and um, and I felt it was really important to uh, express that it is okay for us to take some time and to really slow down, and it's okay to give our staff time to process and to um, start to really nurture um, the, this moment where we can think about um, right now how to heal, how to feel, how to speak to each other, and then. Um, imagine the possibility slowly um, and maybe once in a while do something to feel like you're produ productive and put something out there, but it doesn't have to be on that same, um, you know, hyper state. And I've been very thankful um, to, to do that because ultimately a lot of museums and galleries here have to let go of, 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 of more than half of their staff. And uh, some of them are, are, are in the brink of uh, you know, not being able to, they, a lot of programs are pushed back two or three years um, uh, ahead. So I, some of the programs that we were planning on for 2021 and 22 is now like 23 and 24. So um, that is um, on the one hand, it's kind of uh, daunting, but on the other hand, it's a blessing because it, it really gives um, me an opportunity to make more time um, to think about what is really necessary in the world. Um, because I don't want to continue to just produce for the sake of producing an exhibition or a program just because we want to be busy, but how can we um, uh, be really useful beyond the image making um, for uh, professional development, for artistic um, development and for us to be able to um, really have the opportunity to validate our own work uh, in terms of Asia being able to um, connect with all parts of itself. Um, I'm really working on um, continuing to uh, find ways of imagining bringing people together in real space, in real time. I'm not giving up on um, <laughs> that kind of uh, sort of gathering because as I said, field meeting is about being in the present and the presence of the artist, that there is no such thing as uh, the word and the language and the speech of an artist talking about their work in their own, um, uh, in, from their own interpretations. And um, I'm really committed to finding ways to do that, but it may have to happen in even smaller closed door, you know, non um, uh, fabulous ways for a while. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. Fantastic. So there's, there's hope still for real art exhibitions and not just ones online. 
wonder, there's somebody out there who wants us to know about your own development, both professional and personal drivers. What have they been? Um, hmm. I think my primary driver is the, is, you know, pushing for a world where my people are free. <laughs> 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 it's just, um, it's almost sounds cliche in this moment in time, but it's the truth. Everything I do is tied to that. But then because I'm tied to, you know, the emancipation and freedom of my own people, I'm tied to the emancipation and freedom of all people. So it's all together for me. And that's why I work in many places in the world. And I, in my mind, I'm always connecting things together. And I think the things that keep us down are quite similar across the entire globe anyway. Um, and until we start working together, we can't tackle them. Um, working beyond nation states, I think, is something that comes naturally to me because as an indigenous person, we're, we're inside our own, <laughs> our own nations, inside our own lands and, and have another government on top of us. Um, and our, my particular nation uh, spans um, a lot of Canada and then a lot of the United States. So we don't even acknowledge that border either. And then our people, you know, our larger kind of sense of First Nations, um, the many, many nations that are First Nations within North America and South America, we consider ourselves related, you know? So I think that, you know, that's definitely a driver for me is like the more that I understand the way that our oppressions are connected, but in the same way, the way I understand our um, ability to create, our ability to dream, our ability to, to bring about a new future, all of that is also our humanity. You know, it's, it's who we are. There's, there's no possibility of, of, of that not being who we are. And if, if that becomes a possibility, that's where you get like the most dire situation, which we also have in our communities, which we are working on. <laughs> you know, when people have lost hope, that's the, that's where I think, yeah, um, that's a driver. Art itself has been a driver. When I was young, I went to, um, we don't grow up with art, right? On the reserve, like we don't, other than somebody who paints or draws, like you don't really, you know, or, or um, you know, you do beading like this kind of stuff or quill work or whatever. There's always art around, but I hadn't experienced contemporary art like this, kind of way in which artists are working with materials and um, the way in which they're working with concepts and the way in which um, all of that comes together to create kind of a, a new vision and a new understanding. That I had not seen until I went to a show in, in another city when I was like, I think 14 or 16. And it happened to be the very first um, major exhibition of contemporary indigenous art in Canada. And it was 1992, so it was the whole the whole world was celebrating Columbus, you know, and so our people started saying, actually, you know, you're it's 500 years of colonization. Let's start calling a spade a spade, you know. Let's <laughs> name it what it is. Um, and so that was the first moment where I understood that that there was another option besides political discourse because political discourse to me was failing us and it, it, didn't, it didn't speak to my spirit. But arts, the way that artists can actually see the future that's present now, that's what I think is brilliant. And that's what I found, that was a driver. That's why I went to artists and artwork. Fantastic, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's actually odd to think that, you know, a First Nation, which is the native people of one country can have so much in common with say the largest democracy in the world like India and even Malaysia, we actually have so much in common in terms of trying to overthrow the colonial baggage that we carry around with us in museums, in everyday life. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's good to have this conversation just, just to find out how, how similar we are with your tribe. And that's very nice, it's very comforting. Again, is the way, you know, Lisa's found connections between all the different Asian countries who were not even connected before, but thanks to collective consciousness, we are, we are connected in some way. So Elias, I interrupted you, you were about to say something. 
Uh, uh, no, I just uh, I'm totally agree with uh, what is uh, Wanda is uh, uh, saying about just now. It really, uh, that's that's the that's the right way, you know. I yeah, <laughs> I couldn't say more. It's just I totally agree with you. Yeah. Okay, so Zari Hamza. I can tell by your work. I found your work really really exciting. It is beautiful. Um, Thanks. Yeah, yeah, and I really was. I was wondering. I'm going to leap in here for a second because I, I just want to talk about your actual work okay. um, for a second, just to, uh -huh. to say what, why did, why were you drawn to found, found um, objects and found materials? Because I think uh, it's really profound, you know, in your practice. So, yeah, actually, I, I have this uh, affection of these materials uh, early on, but I didn't know how do I contextualize it, and I just use it as a, a, a part of like a, my palette or part of my. Uh, how to convey my idea. I found these objects has its own meaning and its own history. So I eventually, after I did my graduate study, it comes a uh, full circle. Actually, uh, when we we met our in, in our first discussion with, uh, with our first meeting, I was really interested in the idea of, now I found uh, how, I, how do I end my article uh, for this, my, my recent catalog for this exhibition. Uh, the idea of this indigenous knowledge or uh, over here, what we know as Local wisdom, or in the, uh, what I call this, uh, local knowledge. Uh, so this, this, this is very interesting area or, or subject that I'm really uh, trying to understand what really happened after the revolution, uh, industrial revolution, when the the the, uh, the world become modernized. So uh, mm -hmm. this knowledge has been being uh, diminished, uh, uh, destroyed, or uh, we cannot can continue, or we don't know what is this function, you know. In this this modern world, yeah. So we are struggling to understand, you know, about this. Maybe this we can talk world about is this. Literally making us sick, like literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Us sick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. You yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> but that yeah. idea of the the life of materials, you know, like yes. the artists that I showed that are First Nations, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. They believe they're so attached to the histories of these materials, and the materials themselves are, you know, that is what they're kind of listening to, eh? I mean, although we are still uh, bound with the 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 uh, this Western language, but I'm I'm trying my best to have this uh, idea how to nav nav navigate this this. Um, I I think um, making art is one of the uh, tangible knowledge that you can find. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I I have to just um, uh, acknowledge Shalini um, here, who who's uh, put this uh, group together because it just dawned on me very clearly how connected we all, uh, the yeah. three of us are. Um, yeah. if, you, if you consider, for example, what happened in <clears throat> Central Asia, um, the five countries uh, of, of uh, Central Asia that sort of <clears throat> fell for um, the Soviet bloc, um, what happened with, with um, how they were uh, basically, uh, most of them were nomadic, they were um, tribal uh, people that lived not in cities at all. They were traveling and they were basically cultivating the land on land. And, um, and of course there were um, villages and cities and you know, there were parts of uh, Central Asia that are part, part of the Renaissance of, of uh, uh, Islamic art, but um, the tribal nomadic uh, society and its connection to land was um, so, uh, so traumatized by uh, you know, uh, by by the before even the Bolshevik regime, you mm -hmm. know the czars who slowly took over um, those five countries and mm -hmm. um, uh, the nations like, for example, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, they were forced yeah. um, to leave their land and live <laughs> and build cities, and, and so the, the, like the city life and city um, uh, uh, occupation. Um, has only it's only about uh, 150 to 200 years old in, in, in these regions. The repercussions of that on the collective conscious, on the on on how today the artists are trying to sort of uh, relate to um, now understanding, you know, just even creating a, a story of, of their own creativity, where we we have to go beyond. You know, it's interesting because you said I didn't. I didn't grow up with art, but actually, you did. You know, the 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 the, the tents were an art object. The the everything, the quilts, the the colors, all of that were. That's why I started my talk with the the sandali, a, a heating system in Afghanistan, 
where we, we you sat under the, that that was like a quilt. That's how you warmed yourself there. They put heating um, under there, but but the whole thing was like a, a, a very ritual. Of, it was like an installation that would come together once a year. You would the whole family would get together and you would build this table and you would throw this uh, all of these beautiful things and. That to me is, we need to sort of begin to have our own um, representation of what art and our, its, its development has meant to us in, in our own terms, in our own language, in our own timeline that is separate from what has happened here. And if we choose to have it connect to, to one another, but if not, it's really important that we um, claim um, the, the, the very specificities of how things were viewed and practiced and then bring all of that to the larger um, conversation because what really annoys me um, about uh, the, the story of, of, of Asia is that it's constantly being um, uh, referenced only under this, uh, this sort of derivative um, of uh, the Western <laughs> Um, uh, art all the time. It's like, yeah. oh, you know, anything that has ever happened. Well, if you think about performance and theater, mm -hmm. the, the, it happened as early as cave paintings and it happened in Central Asia. And that is how we need to talk about performance and um, uh, talk about it in the, in the sense of like that, that it has that much history in these regions and um, or theater, for example, or cinema. We don't have to just talk about the history of painting and sculpture. We have to talk about um, oral stories, right? Yes, One, yes. We have to talk about, um, we, we have to bring all aspects of the culture as part of the uh, language of art and art making. And um, I, I think- You show about that. <laughs> you did a show about that. Yeah. <laughs> as an indigenous person, it's you can't forget um, performance or oral history or oral. <laughs> it's like yeah, all connected. Yeah. <laughs> So Zari Hamza has a question for Lisa and Elias. How do you see Malaysian contemporary art playing an important role or contributing uh, to a place in the map of contemporary Asian art? Elias. Yeah, uh, should, should yeah. I start? Okay, uh, to answer this question, I think, uh, how, how, how do I contribute? They say, I, I, couldn't, an, uh, I couldn't answer uh, in, the, in, that, in that sense of contributing, but I think, <clears throat> first of all, when I met <clears throat> artists, like um, I think uh, they are producing good works, but actually right now, I think it's the best time for them to ponder and also rethink about their work or their practice and um, maybe more, do more reading. And I think uh, right now it's not about um, contributing so much. Before you do the contribution, at least you have to know what you are doing right now or maybe uh you know have a have a time you know for yourself to have open your heart to understand what you are doing right now you know that's that's i think yeah, one of the first stages that you have to do rather than uh, after that you can think about contribution you know i think yeah wow mm. that is so well said okay <laughs> Bravely done, Elias. I yeah, yeah. I commend you one hundred percent. Okay, thank you. That I, I actually <laughs> speak with artists is that they because of the internet and sort of the digital information age, um, what yeah. has happened is that the sort of American <clears throat> or sort yeah. of uh, the psyche has um, yeah. penetrated <clears throat> into uh, to the rest of the world, where everyone wants to be <clears throat> a Warhol in five minutes. Yes, yes, and, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, yeah. They've gone to school and they've come <clears throat> out. And, and this is a problem also right here in this atmosphere where um, institutions are pumping out students of art uh, with a title given, given to them that they're artists and they come out and they feel like they're ready and they wanna um, you know, be given exhibitions and put in collections. And there's a lot of a sense of entitlement um, mm -hmm. that gets distributed <clears throat> and this sense of entitlement is being distributed all, all across the world. And I would mm. say um, absolutely what Ilya said, that, that what we, what, how we can contribute is to be really um, committed to, um, uh, to self-development. Uh, yeah. If you practice, if you develop your practice, if you just, uh, you know, you're reading and 
living your work and you're making work every day, not because you have an exhibition or mm -hmm. you've been invited to some place or you've been given a prize, but because it's what you must do or it yeah. is, becomes a discipline, as mm -hmm. um, Ilya said, then, then at some point, um, it, the merit will be built and, and your work will be looked at and seen yeah. and you yourself will be able to see um, the, the specificity of it and its connection to the larger um, context of the art world. And I think I would say that right in this moment, our conversation is part of the contribution that Malaysia is making yes. to the international yeah. arts. Yes. The and GWKL is part of the contribution too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we have time for just one more question. Sorry. Yeah, I agree. One more question. Uh, it's from Jonas Bauer, and it's it's relevant because I think with the pandemic, a lot of funding has been cut. There's less money for the arts and culture. And Jonas wants to know <laughs> what your thoughts are on artists who do not have the means, um, do not have the means to express their art and perspectives, and whose last resort is to make art illegally. He's put illegally in inverted commas. I'm not quite sure what he means, but I'll open it to all of you. Well, I can, I'll start just because I had this conversation recently um, in the sense that I think we assume that art is a, a space of some kind of freedom, but it's not always the case. There are lots of, 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 of things that prevent artists from expressing themselves fully and completely. Um, you know, even here in the West, the market does that, you know, it's like the, the commercial market um, can do that. Um, and artists find ways of, of navigating that. Um, while that does not deal with the illegal part right yet, but I just want to address that part first, that it is something that's happening everywhere in the world in a certain kind of way. Um, I know artists who also don't want to live in cities and that can really prevent your ability to, to engage in art beyond your own space um, because the art that circulates <clears throat> largely has to flow through cities. You know what I mean? It seems to be an issue for artists who want to stay in their, their home communities, especially First Nations artists who want to stay in their reserves or stay back home. Um, mm -hmm. They're often forgotten by everybody somehow. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And then I was talking to a few artists when I was in um, the Middle East who were saying that there's certain perspectives that they can't show in their, in their art. Um, in my community, there's certain kinds of, um, uh, like, we've adopted a kind of patriarchy and we've adopted a kind of homophobia that I say comes from colonialism. It's not tradition. It comes from colonialism. Um, and that can prevent artists from, from, from expressing themselves fully, especially around sexuality. Um, and it also curators have been prevented from showing work artworks um, that have views that the community is like, we don't agree with that view. So there's all kinds of ways in which that happens. I think little weird pressures that artists have that, <laughs> that don't allow freedom of expression. <laughs> yep. um, well, Elias maybe can answer that question in terms of like um, how uh, maybe uh, how you finance yourself, how, how do you survive? Uh, okay, <laughs> how, how do I survive? Okay, uh, um, okay. Uh, I had to do other jobs so I take other projects in 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 order for me to continue my uh, I, call it, uh, I want to have my artwork to have their, their own integrity or to have my independence. You know, I'm 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 only always has this uh, idea of uh, to have this full independence. I would like to take charge of everything. You know. So in order to do that, to have this full independence, I have to sacrifice my time uh, in order to get uh, fundings and everything. I, I mean, I do get fundings also, like um, from like uh, one example is from uh, Go to Institute of Malaysia and uh, several fundings. Uh, and uh, it's a matter also um, commitment, you know? Uh, I mean, when talking about fundings, you have to do proposals and all this, you know? So mm -hmm. artists have to be equipped with, uh, Tons of knowledge, actually, not just uh, artistic knowledge. You know, I mean, talking and everything, and doing proposal, presenting yourself. You know, 
and and her, and also uh, like Wanda is talking about to have a presence, you know, especially in in, in KL and Kuala Lumpur, right? It's always in the city, you know. So uh, yeah, I do agree. So so the, the artists who are living in the not not in the center, it becomes invisible to them, you know. So um, yeah. <laughs> so we've we've come to the end of our session. I, I think we've okay. had quite no. Uh, so <laughs> another hour. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting to see how how connected we all are, despite you know the many differences that we have had to live through, many differences of character and personality and nations. We're all connected in some way or another, and I think that's a comforting thought, especially in in these times. Um, I want to thank my panelists today. Very special thanks to Lisa, Wanda, and Elias, thank and also know. to Stephanie, our yeah, tech Stephanie. Team. Such a great help to all of us. Thank you to Stephanie. Yes. <laughs> and before I go, I'd like to introduce the founder and director of Gallery Weekend Kuala Lumpur, Shalini Ganendra, who would like to say a few words. Take it away, Shalini. I really think Iqbal has done all the hard work. So I, I would just like to thank all of you for doing such an amazing job. It's been such an enjoyable morning. And it's so clear from your voices what your commitment is in terms of connectivity. And you're all such energizes that's really the 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 description that encapsulates what you've spoken about so you know we look forward to keeping in touch with how you continue to energize and connect us to the world and to knowledge that we're not so familiar with and visuals that we need to understand better and the connectivity that we need to make um, and i Thanks Stephanie as well for her technical expertise. Gallery Weekend Kuala Lumpur has virtually pivoted to the virtual this year. So much of the recommendations is online. Uh, we encourage you to go on site onto the social media to look at the wonderful selections, including Elias's um, curatorial endeavors at um, City Art Gallery which is available online as well as yes. in physical, in physical yeah. construct. Yeah. And um, tomorrow, this afternoon, we have another luminary session. So I invite all of you to please attend. And um, we will have the chairman of Sotheby's London for the Middle East and India, uh, Edward Gibbs. We have Aaron Sita, the director of Machan Museum, Jakarta. We have Mustafa, um, we have, sorry, uh, Shabir Mustafa of the National Gallery Singapore and of Sam joining us and curated, uh, moderated by Ernesto Pujan. So please do join us for that session. And just on a parting note, uh, a statement that Wanda made really resonates that um, the way that artists can see the future in what is present now is really an amazing construct. And I would extend that to the way we engage with that creativity really helps us to participate in that journey. And Gallery Weekend Kuala Lumpur thanks you for enabling us to become participants. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. It's a pleasure. Have a great Thanks weekend. Well. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Hello.